board. So um, I'm really excited about this discussion today, responding to dementia related behaviors. Um, and uh, I'm even more excited that this is another partnership with Tall Oaks Assisted Living and Leslie who set up this great sp uh, speaker and topic for us. And, um, and you did a good job of beating the drum because like I said, we've got over 200 registrations. So uh, Leslie, before we meet our panel member, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and Tall Oaks. Okay, great. Thank you, Steve, so much. Um, my name is Leslie Lawson. I am the Director of Community Relations and Marketing here at Tall Oaks Assisted Living. Uh, our community was the first to provide assisted living and memory care here in Reston, Virginia. Our dedicated staff has been here for um, uh, 35 years next year. Uh, so we have our roots in this community. And um, you know, one of our things is about giving back, is about educating, and is about all of us being whole together. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, we're nestled in a woods setting and uh, we have a variety of senior options, uh, vibrant activities, 24 hour nursing care, on-site rehabilitation. Um, and, and what really I think sets us apart is that our entire nursing team, many of which have been here for over two decades, are entirely employed by Tall Oaks. We, we do not uh, have a temporary staff. Uh, everyone is here because we are family. Um, that's enough about Tall Oaks. What we are really here today and why I'm here in this position is to bring our community together, to educate, to empower, uh, and to help one another, uh, especially with uh, the, the struggles that we face with Alzheimer's, dementia, memory care, and caring for our loved ones. Uh, so without further ado, I will toss it back to Steve. First and foremost, though, before we get in, I'm going to put into the chat just a couple of our upcoming events that some of you might be interested in. On uh, November 1st, we are having a Steps to Managing Memory, Alzheimer's Disease and Dementia Care. And um, that's gonna be presented by Andrew Budson, who is the Chief Cognitive and Behavioral Neurology uh, of, of, at the Veteran Affairs in Boston College, as well as a bunch of other accolades, but I don't need to put that on there. Um, and then we also have in our senior scam prevention series, holiday hoax coming up uh, to help us be mindful and watch out for all of the scams that are out there that are taxing our seniors uh, when they have limited time to rebuild those resources. So I will put that in the chat and I would like to thank Bob for being here. Thank you, Steve, for helping to put this on. And um, uh, that's enough out of me. Thank you. No, no this is great. And, uh, and I tell you, uh, so we're going to meet Bob and Kathy here, but just uh, a great endorsement of this program today. Uh, I got an email first thing in the morning uh, from Sister Kathy Weber at Holy Cross, and she's, she says, I'm so glad you're using some of the programs the Alzheimer's presented last month. They were so good not to be shared and heard by more people. So she's already heard this presentation and she loves it. So anybody who knows Sister Kathy in the audience knows that's a, a ringing endorsement. Um, so let's uh, let's get to meet the, the two of you before we um, jump into the presentation. Uh, and uh, uh, Bob, you wanna go first and tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Bob Bell. Um, I'm actually a geriatric social worker by profession trained many years ago in the UK, uh, worked in hospital settings and community settings, um, came across to the States, um, continued my social work career, both um, as an adult protective uh, social worker, protective services social worker, joined the uh, Alzheimer's Association about five years ago and um, was a program manager there for four, for four years, during which time I also uh, facilitated a support group so I'm very familiar with the, um, the importance that offers to caregivers in particular. Um, now working as a community educator for the Alzheimer's Association and, and really looking forward to actually um, sort of presenting this, um, this topic today. And I will start by saying that um, although we're gonna be talking about dementia related behavior, Communication and behavior are completely interlinked. So, and we'll discuss that in more detail. Great. And then you've got your uh, behind the curtain assistant here, Karen Fagan, 
who is going to be running the slide deck. And uh, Karen, uh, tell us a little bit about your yourself. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Karen Fagan. I'm one of the program managers in the local chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. And um, I work closely with uh, folks like Leslie and Steve to uh, create education outreach programs for the community. So thank you very much for uh, inviting us today, Leslie and Steve. Steve, I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen so we can get started. I love it. And then uh, we'll once we know that that is working, we'll drop behind the curtain. And as I do that, I just wanna remind everybody, if a question comes to your mind, just type it in um, and um, let's see. Does everyone see my screen? Yeah, and let's see, I'm just waiting for that one black bar at the bottom. Yeah, it seems to be stuck. Okay, but um, I can always do the sharing uh, if that doesn't disappear here in a moment. Um, uh, let's see, I still see it. Um, you want me to see if I can, uh, now, yeah, now I see another one. So, here, okay, we're don't, done. Yeah, why Let's don't do I, it. why don't I, uh, why don't I see if mine works a little bit better? And uh, we did a test of this earlier and we had, um, we had some issues there. So here and here. Okay, um, can folks see, can you see that? Yes, that's great. All right, so Bob, just, um, you're just gonna tell, you're just gonna say next and then I will uh, advance it for you. Okay, that's fine. Okay, next. Um, right, as I said at sort of the very beginning, I'm, this is a conversation that we're going to actually have and there's no right and no wrong way. And what we're gonna be looking at are different sort of behaviors and trying to understand what is sort of behind them. Um, I alluded to another program and it's actually called Effective Communication Strategies. And it sort of really works in conjunction with this one because for those of you that are caring for somebody or know somebody with dementia, they will often behave in ways that you might find a bit puzzling and think, you know, what's going on here? What are they trying to say? What are they doing by it? And what they're doing is effectively trying to communicate something to you. And the challenge is often trying to unravel what they are doing or what they're actually trying to say. Um, so these are some of the things that we'll be actually looking at. So by the end of this program, we should be able to identify common triggers for behaviors. Um, explain the process for assessing and identifying challenging behaviors and list some of the strategies to address common dementia related behaviors. Next slide. So when we talk about behavioral changes, there could actually be a number of things. And we talk about the word triggers. So a behavior doesn't just you know, pop up for any unwanted reason. There's usually something that has caused it to actually happen. And to be honest, sometimes you may not be able to work it out, but other times you might be able to, and that can actually then help you to respond to the person. So pain or discomfort. Um, the person could have actually fallen. They could have had a fracture. They might not be able to articulate themselves. So they could actually be you know, in discomfort from that. Overstimulation or boredom. Um, you know, we can all get bored. We can equally, we can all get stimulate, overstimulated. So the person could be maybe sitting in a room uh, where there's a lot of noise going on, there's lights, um, there's music playing, and it's just too much for the person to actually take in and process. And that could cause a reaction. Um, fear or frustration just might be going somewhere new or something different or trying to do something um, that the person is not familiar with. Because remember, you know, with dementia, the person's short-term memory um, is very much compromised. So they're relying more on sort of longer-term memory. So something new that's being introduced could actually have a reaction. Um, equally unfamiliar surroundings. And, um, you know, a person could be out for a walk and all of a sudden they become disorientated. I think, where am I? I, I don't recognize this place. And then maybe in a few seconds, then they, it comes back and they realize where they are. 
Um, a complicated task. A complicated task for somebody with dementia could be as simple as trying to do up their shoes, um, trying to uh, fasten a belt, uh, buttons, things like that. And there are ways around that. For example, Velcro shoes can often help um, using sweatshirts or t-shirts so there's no buttons involved um, and um, elasticated waisted pants, things like that, to try and sort of reduce um, the, you know, the, the complications there. Next slide. Right, we're going to talk a lot about this one. Um, and this is really what you're going to be doing all the time that you're actually working with somebody or looking after somebody is you're detecting and connecting. In other words, you need to actually join the person in their reality. And this is, this is sometimes difficult for carers to, to actually accept. You know, some people get it, it's, it can be quite intuitive. Others sometimes struggle with it. And what you have to remember is that the person with the disease, unfortunately, is gonna gradually get worse and worse. We can't expect them to come to us. Therefore, we have to go to them and we have to try and see the world from their reality. You know, what does it feel like? What does it look like? Um, so detecting and connecting, you know, is, is actually quite important. And then while you're doing that, you're also addressing the physical needs as well. Um, you know, is there something going on here? Are they, are they in pain? Are they hungry? Um, do they need to use the bathroom? So all that's happening straight, you know, while you're actually sort of doing the connecting and the detecting and connecting. And then address the emotional needs as well. And I'll give you some examples of that. Um, and then reassess and plan for the next time. And, and this is always one of those areas where people say, you know, yes, I've worked it out, I've cracked it. You know, he or she was behaving in such a way this morning and I came up with a plan and it really worked. And I tried it again at lunchtime and it didn't work think oh no so it's back to square one and reassessing and planning for the next time next slide okay let's talk about this one a little bit more so detecting and connecting joining the person in his or her reality by trying to see the world through their eyes so we become a little bit of a detective here and you can apply this to every time a person actually behaves in a particular way you know, who are they? What is happening? Where is it happening? When does it happen? How does it happen? Um, you know, what took place before, during and after the behavior took place? So let me give you some examples here of how this can actually uh, work. And also bear in mind that we've got communication going on here. So first scenario is a, an elderly man in an assisted living facility. Um, it's in the dining room. It's the end of the meal and he stands up from the table and he starts shouting, red, red, red. And staff are looking around sort of quite confused and think, you know, what, what's going on? What, what's, he, what's he talking about? What's he trying to say here? So he's behaving in a particular way. So who is he? Well, let's call him Fred. So Fred's standing up, he's shouting, he's actually doing it in the dining room. And what's, what, why is he doing it? You know, do we need to do something about it? Well, staff speak to the family and they find out that in his younger years, Fred had an apple orchard and he used to grow red apples. So what Fred was actually, he couldn't remember the word apple, but he was associating the color from his long-term memory. And he was really basically saying, you know, I want an apple. So sometimes when you're dealing with behavior, um, when you talk about the sort of the context, also the setting, in which it might actually be happening. Now, because this was actually in the dining room, it might have been possible to sort of work through this and think, okay, maybe this has got some sort of food association here um, that we can actually work with. Another example is an elderly woman who um, at this point was actually non-verbal. In other words, she wasn't able to articulate herself. And she was receiving home care support and uh, the aide was there one day, and as part of the task, the aide would get this lady or help this lady to actually get dressed. And one day she was helping her to get dressed, and the woman leant forward and she started pinching the, the caregiver, the aide. And she thought, what's going on here? So 
she told her supervisor about it and the supervisor said, okay, I'll, I'll come out and watch and see what's going on. So she went out the next day and observed the, the, the procedure and said straight away, I realized what it was. And it transpired that as part of the task of actually getting this lady dressed, the carer was applying the white compression stockings, head stockings. Well, they're very tight fitting. And what they were doing was actually pinching the, the woman. So she was leaning forward and pinching the A to try and tell her, these are hurting, these are pinching me. So again, you've got an example of behavior and a form of communication because you couldn't articulate it. So this is always important to remember that why the person might be doing something, they're trying to tell you something. Um, okay, next slide. Uh, the physical needs. So it could be a medical issue. Um, it could be hunger or it could be thirst. Um, it may be a lack of social interaction as well. Um, it may be a reaction to a new medication um, that's causing a side effect. Um, um, it could be poorly fitting dentures. Um, you know, and here's another example, actually, and, th and this one actually involved me when I was doing um, adult protective services. I got called to a nursing home because an elderly woman um, had complained to staff that there'd been a marijuana party going on the night before. And so I started an investigation by which time she was already back in hospital. Um, and it transpired, it was actually um, a confliction with a medication that she was on that was causing her to actually hallucinate in the end. So these things can actually happen. Um, a most common fault, or not fault, um, cause of behavior is a urinary tract infection. And care homes are pretty good these days about sort of identifying and screening um, elderly people for that. But that could be another reason for a sudden change in behavior. But always bear in mind that if it's a real drastic change that you may need to contact the person's doctor or seek medical help. Okay, next slide. Understanding and addressing the behavior. So we talk about emotional needs and, and this is really very, very important. Um, and, and sort of using your knowledge of the person's preferences to provide effective interventions, et cetera, et cetera. I'm gonna give you a couple of examples here and I use these ones quite a lot. So my apologies to those of you who have heard this presentation before, but I think it sort of really brings it home. Um, the first one involves me. So my wife asked me to go outside and dig five holes and to plant five bulbs in the, in, and put one uh, flower bulb in each hole. So bear in mind, I've got dementia and I think, okay, fine. So I go out, I dig one hole and I throw all five bulbs in the hole, cover it all up and stand back and say, I've done it. Well, it could go one of two ways. My wife could turn to me and say, that's not what I asked you to do. I wanted five holes, separate holes, and I wanted you to put one bulb in each hole. Well, she's challenging me, she's criticizing me, and I'm probably not gonna to be too happy about this, but there's not an awful lot I can actually do. But emotionally, I will probably feel quite depressed. Um, conversely, she could come out and say, oh, thank you very much, that's great. You've done exactly what I wanted you to do. You know, that's, that's really helped me a lot. Well. She's congratulated me, she's praised me. So I'm actually gonna feel good. So she's focusing on the feelings, not the actual facts. And that's important because later on, she can go and dig four holes and transpose the other bulbs into the other holes. So <coughs> focusing on feelings is important. Another example is Gladys. And Gladys is an elderly woman in a, in a care home. And she's on what we call the memory care unit. So it's a secure unit and to prevent people with dementia from wandering off and, and obviously uh, a risk of harm to themselves. So it's late afternoon and Gladys is standing by the doors, sort of shaking the doors, rattling on the doors. So a member of staff comes up to Gladys and says, you know, Gladys, what, what's going on? What, what are you trying to do? And she said, I've got to get home. I, you know, I've got to get my kids off the school bus. And uh, I've got to get my husband's dinner ready. 
To which the aide turns around and says, oh, Gladys, you know, your kids are growing up, your husband's dead, come on. Well, how do you think that's gonna go down with Gladys? Probably not very well. Um, because in her mind, her kids are little, you know, they're still around. Her husband, he's at work. And this is probably gonna ruin the rest of her afternoon. It's probably gonna cause an increase in agitation, um, anxiety. Um, the staff are probably going to have a more difficult time in managing her reaction to this. So this is what we called sort of the reality theory that fortunately we no longer practice or shouldn't be practicing. We then move on to what we call the therapeutic fiblet. And this can actually work quite effectively, um, but it, you have to avoid overusing it. So let's say same scenario, now it's tomorrow, and um, there's another member of staff who sees Gladys standing by the door. Gladys, what's going on? What, what are you standing here for? Got to get home. Got to get the kids off the bus. Got to get my husband's dinner ready. Oh, Gladys, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you. The kids are staying behind for after school activities and um, your husband phone, he's going to be late home today. Oh, OK, well, that might work. You know, you've, you've sort of reassured her, you've sort of met her emotional need um, and you've given her this little uh, therapeutic fiblet. Now, tomorrow you see Gladys standing there and you offer her the same response. Kids are staying behind after school, husband's gonna be home late. And chances are Gladys will say, you told me that yesterday and I still didn't see my kids or my husband, where are they? And that could cause an increase in her anxiety. So <coughs> as I say, that one is, it's, it's useful, but sometimes it needs to be used sparingly. Nowadays, we talk about validation. So roll forward to tomorrow or today. Gladys is by the door. Different aide comes up, says, Gladys, what's going on? Need to get home, kids off the bus, husband's dinner. Tell me about your kids. What sort of things do they like to do? And um, what sort of work is your husband involved in? Or was he involved in? Be careful how you phrase it. And um, do you know, I smell some fresh coffee and cookies down in the lounge. Why did you tell me about it? You know, while we have a drink and, and, and a cookie together. So what you've done there is you've validated her needs, her emotions. You're not telling her that the kids are grown up or that her husband's dead. You're joining her in her reality, but you're also seeking to validate her, her emotional needs. And that's important here. But at the same time, you're also sort of redirecting and trying to distract her by giving her something else to do, another task, in the hope that she will actually forget uh, what has actually taken place. And if Gladys is standing there tomorrow, then you can still do that Again, you can introduce that emotional need, that a validation of what she's actually saying. And that's what my wife should have done with the bulbs, is validated what I had done. Forget the fact that I dug one hole and put all the bulbs into one. It was my feelings. How did I feel about it? You know, and that's really what we're trying to do when we're trying to connect with a person. Okay, next slide. Let's have a listen to Rose. She was part of the family, you know, she'd fold towels and she'd fold towels all day long some days. Just, you know, put them back in the basket and then she'd give them to her, here's some more towels. And it sound, it may look, sound like it's cruel, but look, it kept her busy. It kept her movements going. It kept her, you know, just kept her occupied and it kept, and it made her feel um, wanted and that she was contributing. We created a routine for her that worked for her around her agitation and, you know, her sleep patterns. So every day she was in the same routine for the most part. And every day she did something. She was always in the kitchen every day helping do something. Sometimes she'd rinse dishes. But she was always near the kitchen sink because she spent most of her life in front of the kitchen sink. Now she was just doing it in different ways. And um, yeah, going for a walk, going out in the car for a drive, uh, walking around the yard, you know, um, watering plants. Those are all things that she did and we just had her continue doing them. 
So these are good examples. And um, what you can also do is, um, is socks. And I've seen that work very effectively. Get a basket of socks, um, all separated, and then ask the person to say, oh, do you know, I'm really busy right now. Can you give me a hand? Again, you, you're working on those emotions and those feelings. Um, it'd be really helpful if you could actually fold these socks into pairs for me. And the person might be, yeah, okay, fine. So if you've got lots of colorful and patterned socks, then they could put them together into pairs. And then what you could do is take them out of the room afterwards, go into you know, somewhere else, take them all apart again, come back and say, oh, I found another box here. You know, I'm really struggling. Can you do these for me? And then they'll probably sit down or carry on folding those up and, and making pairs out of them. So there's lots of things you could actually do there. Okay, next slide. Oh, sorry, go back. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, so reassess and plan for the next time. So we're back to the detecting and connecting. We're joining the person's reality. What went well and what didn't? Well, we've seen from Gladys' example what went well and what didn't actually happen, you know, and how can we make adjustments? So sometimes you, you're really having to sort of think on your feet all the time. Um, as I say, and there is no right answer, um, but it's trying. And it's also very important to know the person better than the disease. You know, don't get hung up about the disease. Unfortunately, I say it's going to get hung up. We know it's, a, it's an awful disease and we know things are going to change, but make sure you know who the person is. You know, what are their likes? What are their dislikes? Next slide. So what we've talked about so far is you can apply these to any behavior. So, you know, you're detecting and connecting. In other words, you're, you're, you're meeting that person where they are. At the same time, you're thinking to yourself, is there anything physical going on here? Um, and, um, you know, and then the emotional needs. Well, OK, am I, am I actually addressing them? Are they going to feel comfortable? Ah, oh, that didn't work. I need to go back and reassess and plan for the next time. OK, next slide. Anxiety or agitation? Well, we know Gladys experienced both of those the first time when she was told that her kids uh, were growing up and her husband was dead. Restlessness, pacing, distress, over-reliance. There's, there's a reason the person's doing this. You know, there, there's a trigger here. They're not just doing it, getting up and wandering around or doing it for whatever reason. And we have an example with the workbook that actually accompanies this. And it's, it's an elderly woman called Anne. And it's late afternoon. And she's walking around the house um, which is where she lives with her family. And she keeps saying, I've got to go. I've got to go. Well, go where? Physically, Anne is actually starting to develop blisters on her feet. And her family are actually finding it a real struggle to get her to sit down um, and, and eat a meal. So they're sort of having to resort to sort of finger food. And, and sort of feed her while she's actually walking around. Now we've got some clues here. And as I said, this is sort of happening sort of late in sort of the afternoon. So we have a situation called sundowning, which many of you might be aware of. And it's a, it's a time sort of late afternoon as the sun is going down, when people with, uh, with dementia often become more um, anxious. Um, they, they might start pacing. Um, they're probably gonna become tireder as well but you can find this increased agitation that is also taking place. So what's happening here with Anne? Well, what we actually find out is that Anne is actually a retired nurse. And for 40 years, she worked on the night shift. So for Anne, her day, if you like, starts in the evening. That's when she was working. So when Anne is saying, I've got to go, I've got to go, she, she's referring, she, you know, she, her mind, is going back to um, you know her her years ago. It's, it's that long term memory and that routine of getting ready in the evening to go to work. Well, obviously you want to try and address that. So you know we're talking about validation here as well, but also trying to redirect her um, to get her to sort of sit down. And there's various things that you could actually employ here, and a little bit like um, you know the towels and the socks. So, and I've seen these work actually quite efficiently. So for example, we know Anne is a retired nurse. So think of things sort of, you know, medically, if you like. Um, you could try the therapeutic fiblet, 
Oh, Anne, so, oh, sorry, I forgot to tell you, the, um, the hospital phoned up and uh, you've got the night shift off. Okay, great, might work tonight. You try that line tomorrow. And she said, ah, I wouldn't get two nights off in a row. No, no, that's wrong, that's wrong. Okay, so plan, reassess, and think, okay, what do I do next? Empty pill bottles, get a bag of M&Ms, all different colors. And these pills came and they need sorting out into the uh, different bottles here. Can you sort them out for me? So get lots of empty pill bottles and get her to put different colored pills or the same color pills into different bottles. Get some folders, some manila folders or something. And it could be charts, uh, charting. So you could ask her to, and they maybe fill them with paper or have different colored paper and ask her to sort the different colored paper into different uh, charts. So you're giving her something to do. And that's what she needs. She, you know, she, she's, she's bored. Um, you know, we talked about that at the very beginning, because this is when she actually needs to be doing something and wants to do something. Okay, um, next slide. Confusion or suspicion, not recognizing familiar people, places, things, accusing others of theft, infidelity, etc. All the above. Um, sometimes families. Um, will get hung up over um, being misidentified or being called by the wrong name. You know, you pick your battles and it's better that, you know, if dad calls me Bill um, instead of Bob, it's better that he actually recognizes me as somebody he knows and that somebody, you know, he's comfortable with than the fact that he got me my name wrong. Equally, it'd be not a appropriate for me to say, you know, dad, my name's Bob, not Bill, you're confusing me. To which he might say, don't argue with me. You, you know, you're Bill. So you get into this sort of argument and nobody wins an argument with somebody with dementia. So it's better just to, as I say, just accept the fact that, you know, he's called me by the wrong name. Now I say about getting hung up about this. Unfortunately, for some people, that is just another sign that the person is actually progressing further along in the disease. And it's a reminder that they're starting to forget things. And that can be hurtful. You know, the person without the disease, you know, may not have come to terms yet with the fact that, uh, you know, their loved one um, is, is actually getting worse. Um, so it's a slight sort of denial. Accusing others of theft, um, one client of mine uh, was absolutely certain that her carer had stolen her hand mirror. And um, she used to sit on the sofa and there was lots of papers and that around on the floor. And I said, you know, have you looked on the floor? Have you looked under all the papers? I know she's taken it. She's definitely taken it. She doesn't like me. I know she's taken it. Well, let's have a look and see if we can actually find it. And the hand mirror was on the floor under some papers. She said, ah, she said she put it there. She hid it from me. I know she did. Well, there's not an easy way around that one. You just have to obviously try and reassure her that, you know, we've found it and, and that's good. The infidelity, um, this can actually, uh, and unfortunately this does actually happen. If you've got particularly a woman um, with dementia at home and her husband is there, he's the primary caregiver and they have a home carer. Well, majority of home carers tend to be female. There's not a huge amount of male carers. So you've got a female carer who's looking after this woman and the husband's there. And what happens is that a person with dementia thinks that her husband's having an affair with the carer and then refuses to actually have the care. Well, that one or two hours you know, every day might be the only form of respite that that husband actually gets. And, and desperately needs. So the last thing that he needs is for that to actually uh, end. Um, so there would have to be ways that she would have to work around that, or he'd have to work around that. But these can actually happen. Um, the confusion or suspicion, at uh, one support group um, I was at, uh, one of the participants said that uh, the night before she'd actually woken up and um, that her husband had sort of woken up as well for some reason and turned to her and said, who are you? And she said, well, you know, I'm your wife. He said, no, you're not, get out of bed. Where's my wife? And she said, I had no option. I, I had to get out of bed. And 
I went into the other room for a few minutes and then sort of came back into bed and got in and, you know, the event had happened. It, it, it passed on and uh, he, he, you know, we all went back to sleep. And she said, I know it's the disease, but she says, you know, I'm a human as well. And it was really hurtful. And uh, I mean, this woman was, it, she was in tears as she was talking about it. And fortunately, the support group, everybody there was very supportive of her. Um, but things like that can actually happen. Um, another instance was a, a, a client also in the community. This was a younger woman who had what we call early onset dementia. In other words, she was diagnosed before the age of 65. And in the evening, when the lights were on in the kitchen, she was seeing her reflection in the glass and she wasn't recognizing it. And she thought it was actually people looking in at her and was getting quite anxious about it and agitated. So her husband actually had to put blinds up on the window to stop, um, to break off, you know, the reflection. And equally mirrors as well. She mirrors in the house. She wasn't recognizing herself in the mirrors. And so they had to take sort of mirrors down as well. Next slide. Uh, aggression, maybe verbal or physical, uh, may occur suddenly for no apparent reason, or again, it may emerge following a trigger. Quick example here is an elderly man in a facility and um, the tannoy system is actually broadcasting and it's all very fuzzy, you can't quite make, him, make out what it is. But anyway, he's got a walking stick with him or a cane and he starts to wave it around and he's likely to actually hit people close by. So something happened here, there was a trigger. And in this instance, the trigger was actually the tannoy system. And this one actually appears on a, on a sort of a training video. And it's actually very good because um, it shows you sort of a right way and a wrong way. And the wrong way then is that one of the care staff comes up and tries to grab him to try and get him to stop waving the stick around. Then it sort of fast forward to the next one and it, the, the same sort of care aide comes out of a room, sort of stands close to the man and says, Colonel. And with that, the man stops immediately what he's doing and puts his, the cane down on the floor. Or, just stop. He's holding on to it, but he's got it beside him. And uh, the aide then carries on and says, Colonel, your men are waiting for you in the dining room. They're waiting for their orders. And uh, he says, OK, fine. So the trigger here was, and, and obviously they'd worked this out, that this man was a retired military person. The tannoy system was something that he would have been familiar with throughout his sort of career. And what he did, the aide, he met the person where he was. In other words, he joined his world because as far as that elderly man was, he was still a colonel and uh, he had his men to sort out. And uh, that intervention there actually sort of worked. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, let's listen to Rose again. On the tough days, my husband and I would switch off, uh, and my mom had forgotten all her English and had gone back to speaking only Greek. So she just spoke Greek, and my husband doesn't speak Greek, so it was perfect. So when she was agitated and she was cussing and yelling and saying all kinds of obnoxious things, my husband couldn't understand. So to him, it didn't matter. So when she was in that mode, we'd switch off, and you know he'd take her for a drive. She'd stare out the window, eat fries, and she'd be fine. And they would give me a break to really decompress from some of the stuff she was saying that I know she was just saying them, their words, but you know, I'm a human being as well and I was taking them personally. Okay, a little bit like the woman whose husband, um, you know, denied that she was his wife. Okay, aggression then. Usually aggressive behaviors are upsetting but not dangerous. Um, if there are weapons involved uh, and if you have to call 911, then do alert them to the fact that there are weapons in the home. And obviously the ideal thing is to actually have weapons all removed um, if you have got somebody with dementia. Um, if the aggression happens on a regular basis, then speaking with the person's doctor about possible medical intervention may be necessary. Okay, next slide. Right, repetition. Um, although it's partly communication, it's also sort of behavior related. Saying something over and over, repeating words, questions or behaviors 
this is probably one of the most frustrating um, aspects of the disease that people will speak about, particularly carers, is when people ask that same question over and over again. So, um, for example, um, I'm caring for, uh, let's say I'm caring for my father. And he says, uh, what time's lunch? And I said, oh, it's 12 o'clock. Oh, okay, fine. So a few minutes later, what time's lunch? Oh, it's at 12 o'clock. Oh, okay. 10 minutes later, what time do you say lunch is? I've already told you twice, it's at 12 o'clock. So what's happened here? I now have really got an attitude and my dad with his dementia is actually gonna pick up on my attitude towards him. And the only reason he's asked me what time is lunch three times is because he's forgotten that he's actually asked me that, that question before. And if I say to him, dad, you've asked me that question three times, he's gonna say, no, it's not, no, I haven't. This is the first time I've asked you because he can't remember. So how do we overcome this sort of behavior, which is, can cause a lot of frustration for people? A whiteboard is, is a helpful tool. Um, by, um, so you could actually have on the whiteboard then a sort of eight o'clock uh, breakfast, 10 o'clock exercise, 11 o'clock walk, 12 o'clock lunch. So the first time he asked me, what time is lunch? I can say, well, it's at 12 o'clock. Okay. And then when he asked me again, what time is lunch? I said, well, let's go and have a look at the board and see what's over there. So we can go to the board and I can say, okay, we've got eight o'clock lunch, uh, breakfast, 10 o'clock um, exercise, 11 o'clock walk. Ah, oh, here we go, 12 o'clock lunch. Okay. And then if he asked me again in a few minutes, what time is lunch? We can direct him back to the board. This actually is quite effective and can work. And some people suggest that once an activity has taken place to actually erase that from the board as well. But that way, you know, you can respond to the behavior um, and, and, and address it. Um, right. Um, okay, so sort of another thing with repetition, and um, sometimes this can actually cause um, sort of frustration for people, is uh, let's say I tell my dad that um, my son is going to be coming home soon and he's going to be uh, visiting us and my dad gets on really well with his grandson so i said oh you know dad you know freddie's coming home soon oh great okay um when's freddie coming home what time's freddie coming home did you say freddie's coming home when's he coming home and this will probably then carry on and on and on so if you've got an event or somebody's actually going to be visiting it can actually be quite useful to wait until nearer the time to actually tell them um, you know, oh, dad, Freddie's coming later today, and rather than sort of telling him well beforehand. Okay, next slide. Wandering. 60% oh, of people with dementia will wander, and it can happen at any stage without warning. Wandering is one of those really difficult uh, behaviors, and there are numerous things that you can actually do. Um, to try and reduce it if you're looking after a person at home, etc. cetera. Um, I had one case in England. This was a, an elderly woman in the community and um, she had three adult children and they would take it in turns to visit her at night or late in the afternoon, the evening and make sure that she was in the house and then they would lock the door and, and sort of, uh, and then leave. And they were telling me about this and they thought, you know, we're really doing a good job here, keeping her safe. And I said, okay, so what happens if there's a fire or an emergency and she can't get out? Ah, we haven't thought about that. So some people do things with the best intention in the world, um, but in this case, it obviously, um, it would have had consequences. Um, wandering around the house, there are things that you can do, alarms on windows, um, alarms on doors. A very simple and effective um, device is a round black round mat by the front door or doors because with the disease people's vision can also be affected in terms of their processing of what they're actually seeing so they might see the object but their brain is not processing it as effectively as it was before so when the person sees this sort of round black circle by the door to them it might actually be a big black hole and if I step on that hole, 
I'm going to fall into it and that. So that helps to maybe direct the person away. Um, years ago, I was talking with a, a daughter who was looking after her mother who was concerned. And I suggested she get a stop sign. Because if you think of the stop sign, how many of us actually really read it? We see it and we recognize it for what it is and we respond to it. So I suggested to this daughter, get a stop sign and put it on the inside of the front door. And I met her again months later and she said, you know, I did that. And mum never went to that door again, never tried to leave. So sometimes simple things can actually be quite effective. Okay, let's have a listen to Beverly. And um, after Beverly's spoken, I'll go back through some of the things that she actually said. Later in, uh, in this journey, and I call it a journey, uh, he decided that he was going home to his wife. And one New Year's Eve, he looked out the window and there was a house down the street that had all the lights on and he decided that that was his house. And it must have been, I'd say, at least two below zero. And he was going to leave. I had a double lock on the door, but I had left the key in and he decided he was leaving. And I said, well, Amos, I'm your wife. No, you're not. My wife is waiting for me. And he would laugh when I said that I was his wife. So he got up and I said, Amos, I'm going to call the police if you walk out the door. And Amos, in his usual manner, said, you do what you have to do. And he walked out the door. Well, he walked out in his house shoes two blocks down the street. And I got in the car and drove around. It just so happened that it was a neighbor's mother and she knew what was happening and she talked to him and we got him back in the car and drove him home. Okay, so before we look at this slide, you can leave this slide up actually. Let's just talk a little bit about Beverly and what actually happened there. Um, there's a number of things actually. She, she was argumentative. When her husband said, or when she said to her husband that uh, I'm your wife, and he said, no, you're not. Um, that was the first thing. She was challenging towards him, and she was also threatening in the sense that um, if you go out, I will call the police, to which he said, well, you do what you have to do. She could have handled it differently. Um, it was unfortunate that the keys were left in the front door. When he said, you know, um, you're not my wife, the validation could have come in here. Tell me about your wife. You know, what does your wife look like? Um, you know, what sort of things does she like to do? Um, it was very cold outside. He wanted to leave, so she could have redirected him and said, look, you know, it's really cold out there right now. Why don't we have a cup of hot chocolate? And, um, and then I'll help you actually go and look for your wife with you. So again, it's sort of that redirection. So what she's doing there would have been to validate him and also hope that in the time that he has his hot chocolate, he would have forgotten that he was actually wanting to actually leave. So there are different ways to respond. Okay. This is coming to the end of it because I want to allow time to sort of questions and all that. Um, ALZ.org um, is our website. Um, you will find loads of information. More information about this program today can actually also be found on here. Probably the most important one is the 800 number, 800-272-3900. This is our 24 seven helpline in Chicago. And it is staffed, well, obviously 24 seven, um, with master's level conditions. And for many carers, you know, at two o'clock or three o'clock in the morning, when they're at their wits end in trying to uh, look after their loved one, picking up that phone and phoning Chicago can often be a real lifeline to that person. So it is a useful resource. And also if you just wanted to know what is available locally, um, they can redirect you to the local chapter. Okay, next slide. All right, any questions then from this presentation? All right, we got tons of questions. <laughs> so okay. Let me get you a few of these here. And um, so let's see, this one was 
before we even start started, but it's from Susan. It says, Bob, is there a study to join for people who have parents with dementia or prevention methods that you might recommend? And um, yeah. Um, a, a well, there's no study that I'm aware of um, that people can join. That there's a lot of resources available. The only studies that I'm aware of are for, um, for people with the disease to join what is called trial match. Uh, for people to sign up for clinical trials to help towards uh, finding a cure for the disease. Um, you know, if, if you're looking after parents and that with the disease, then I would sort of certainly recommend visiting our website and looking at the different uh, course, you know, presentations that we offer. Um, also, you know, joining a support group. And, and I can't over overemphasize the importance of support groups for people who are looking after somebody. Great. Okay, now this is one that I've, I've heard. It's a long question, but I'm going to try to paraphrase here. But uh, Janet says, my cousin is 94, has moderate stage dementia, still lives in an independent living apartment with home health aides. She does not know or accept her diagnosis. Besides memory issues, she also exhibits behavioral issues, refusing to do things. Um, some delusional thinking, saying she wants to go home, sounding angry, fearful. How do we react? Accept her reality or try to reason with her? <laughs> That's an interesting one. If she's 94 and she's got moderate dementia, she's doing quite well. Um, trying to, uh, it, it's very difficult to try and reason with somebody who's got dementia, because as far as they're concerned, everything that they say is, is right. So, um, trying to, to you know, explain to them otherwise is probably going to be quite difficult. Safety is obviously you know, an important factor here. Um, a lot of it goes back to what we saying, how I said earlier about knowing the person better than the disease. You know, who are they? What, who, what did they do? What was their sort of history? And just to explain that very, very quickly, I was often asked by families, what do we say to mum when she asks where dad is? Dad's been dead a few years. And what do we say to her? And my response to that is always being, well, you know her better than anybody else. You know, how is she likely to react to that? And in my particular case, my mother-in-law would occasionally say, you know, where's John? And we could say to her, oh, he's died. Oh, that's right. Yeah, fine. And she moved on. Others, could have actually, you know, caused, caused a complete meltdown. So in answer to your question, you know, it's, it's really, you know, who is she? What, are, what is she like? What do you think that you can actually get away with? And what can you tell her? Can you use a therapeutic fiblet? Um, you know, can you use excuses? Um, you know, if she's not wanting to shower or to bathe, well, can you sort of spice that up a little bit? Could you actually have candles and soft music playing um you know make it a sort of like a fun event that oh we're going out for lunch or we're going out somewhere special let's get you all you know uh tidied up before we go um great you know great. i appreciate it's clutching at straws a little bit but you're looking for any angle um as i say and you really have to sort of think outside of the box sorry a long answer there no, great examples, and um, and I think uh, who was it here? Scott says thanks so much for this presentation. is very well done, incredibly helpful, excellent examples to build on. And I I, I agree that that's it's it, it's kind of like you're a detective, you know, trying yes. to figure out you know how to solve this case and uh, trying different things and going down different paths. But I think the key is it's 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 tapping into clues as opposed to being frustrated and trying the same thing over and over again with the same outcomes. Um, Absolutely. Let's see. I mean, a good, you know, an example of that, um, this was an elderly woman in a facility and she hadn't been there very long and they contacted the daughter and they said, um, your mum keeps refusing to have a bath. And, and she said, well, that's, that's not really like her or a shower, you know, that's not unusual. She said, what are you actually doing? She said, well, we wheel her into the bathroom, we take all her clothes off her and we try to shower and she's refusing. 
Whoa, 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 whoa. My mom was a very, very private person. She didn't even take my her clothes off in front of my dad. So, you know, let's look at this a different way. Let's put a towel around her shoulders. You know, let's keep her underwear on or something. Let's provide some privacy and some dignity for this woman. Mm-hmm. So again, you know, who are who is the person? How can you respond to them in a positive way, you know, that's respectful? I love it. Okay, Mary Jane Spence says, is there a resource that would tell me what the stages of dementia and Alzheimer's are from onset to end stages? And uh, Karen, uh, I think I know that there are some really good pages on the Alzheimer's Association website. Maybe you could uh, drop those into chat. But, I just did, Steve. Okay, great, great. Um, let's see, Dorcas says, oh, this is one that's close to my heart, Dorcas. Uh, what can be done when aggression is handled by a facility by sending a person to the ER? Are there dementia-friendly ERs, emergency rooms? Um, the ER is the worst place to send a person. I had a, a friend of mine who had an unfortunate uh, dementia challenge in an ER, but uh, any words of wisdom there, Robert? Um. Well, in the first instance, I would try to avoid sending them to the ER. It's probably the worst place for them. Now, I obviously appreciate if it's a medical emergency. You know, there's a lot I could actually say in response to that question that I don't want to. Um, but why, you know, what was the behavior in the first place that, ha- that, you know, resulted in them having to be sent to the ER? Was it simpler for the staff just to sort of shift the person off rather than actually trying to deal and understand what the person was doing and actually why they were doing it. Uh, she hit someone. Okay, but why did she hit someone? Could staff have actually intervened before? And why sending them off to the ER? Is that going to, you know, what was hoping, what were they hoping to achieve by doing that? Mm-hmm. Um, similar situation, I, you know, again, you know, I did APS work. Um, was called to an assisted living facility. There were two women in a secure unit. And they were both sitting at a table opposite each other. And one of the women was sitting there and she was going, I'm sure you can all hear this. She was banging on the table. But what do you think happened after a while? The woman that was sitting opposite her leaned across and slapped her because she was so frustrated. When I investigated it, there were two staff actually in the room seated at a desk some distance away. So my question was, why weren't you proactive? you could see something was actually going to happen here. So unfortunately, a lot of this comes down to staff training. And as I said, I don't want to get into that as a completely separate discussion there. Um, But, you know, knowing that person, and I will say this to family members, if you've got somebody who's going into facility, make sure they actually have a social history about that person. You know, who are they? Who were they before they came into that facility? What are their likes? What are their dislikes? You know, what food do they like? What colors do they like? You know, and then staff need to read that though as well to have a better understanding of who that person is. A lot of facilities have shadow boxes in the memory care unit. And these are sort of like, uh, if you're not familiar with the term, um, they're like picture frames, but deep picture frames that hang outside the doors of to, to people's rooms. There was one facility I went to and this woman had three photographs in her shadow box. And there were a picture of her with three presidents and she'd worked in the White House. Can you imagine the sort of conversations you could actually have, you know, with somebody like that? Social history is so important. Sorry, I'm gonna get off my- No, no, that's that's great. Um, Janet uh, Gritz has uh, a question that I think a lot of our families are, are dealing with is, how do you respond to, I want to go home? Um, okay, there's different ways you could actually do with that. Um, depends where they are. Um, talk, tell me about home. What do you like about home? Um, sort of redirect the conversation if you can. I have known people to, um, if their loved ones is going to go for, say, like respite care into a facility, they've talked about it being a hotel. Um, I've also had some families say, you know, mum's been here for a while now. And she keeps saying, I really like this hotel. The staff here are lovely and the food's great. To which I've usually said, fine, if that's what they think, then, you know, you're fortunate there. 
Um, but, you know, if the person is sort of adamant, you could, you know, to turn around and say, well, you can't come home right now. You need to find a way around that. Um, well, you know, let's talk about that a bit more. You know, what, what is it you like about home? What, what do you like about this place? What, what's good here? You know, what's the food like? Redirect, distract them to try and get them away from that topic. Um, but obviously, you know, meet, validate what they're saying. I understand you want to go home and, um, you know, we're trying to work to that, but the doctors are saying that you still need to be able to stand up on your own or do a little bit more therapy. So rather than just, well, no, I'm sorry, you've got to stay here. So validate it. Okay. Um, let's see. This is, you, you know, it, I, I always tell people it's sort of like if mom or dad has dementia and they're happy and smiling, but just not present in the way you remember, that's one thing. But when, what do you do when the um, Karen and Kevin are asking, when somebody is sort of goes down that dark rabbit hole of dark delirium and, you know, potentially talking about murdering or, you know, things smelling bad and just being really angry or disruptive, any suggestions in that area um that might that might prompt a conversation with the person's doctor physician um you know there, there, there may need to be some uh, pharma, pharmacological intervention required for something like that well and so often we find you know individuals that are aggressive or sort of very negatively disruptive they're, they're sort of jumping from one memory care center to another because nobody can figure out how to handle them. And it's, uh, it's very difficult. Yeah, it's quite true. I mean, they're obviously frontal temporal dementia. Um, we know causes a lot of aggression and sort of non-social um, activities. Um, you know, this, this again sort of goes back, if you like, Certainly, I feel partly to, you know, to training, to staff training and understanding and awareness, because, and it goes back to what we've been talking about today. Yes, the person might be aggressive, they might be doing something, but it's a behavior, you know, and they're trying to tell us something. And it could be, yeah, a very good comment just come up there, dual diagnosis of mental health with dementia. That is so difficult to manage. And, um, and I think in some respects, my, my mother-in-law actually had that as well. Um, but you know, why are they doing it and how, how can you manage it? And obviously you've got other, you know, staff and other residents to consider if, if they're in a facility. Um, but there is usually a reason why the person is doing it and it could actually just be boredom, you know, or frustration. Um, let's see, uh, lately my mother, uh, Patrice says, lately my mother's been getting upset when I'm away from her for about 10 minutes. I'm in the room or the house but she can't see me. Mm -hmm. uh, any ideas for that one? No, I mean, that's not uncommon, actually. Um, you know, a person is, they're, they're sensing that loss there. And people sometimes talk about, you know, I feel like I've got a shadow that they, they follow me all the time. You, you really, you're trying to reassure the person, you know, mom, I'm here, you know, I'm just in another room, I'm doing something. Yeah. Um, and, and experiment with different things. I know that we don't like to, I mean, for some people, uh, an Alexa device may not work. Mm -hmm. However, for someone else, it may be a way for you to communicate from another room and get yeah. peace of mind. Or maybe it's a recording of your voice or something like that. But, you know, I think that's one of the things that your presentation has shared with me today is we've got to get creative. And, Absolutely. You've got yeah. to think outside the box here. Yeah. You know? And as I say, and if it doesn't work, fine, reassess and try something different the next time. Um, uh, and you might find yourself doing that, you know, repeatedly. Okay, here's one. Uh, what's the best way to respond when my husband locks me out of the room where he is? Number one, I, I want to hear what Bob is going to say. But uh, my advice there is we dealt with this when we had little kids. We <laughs> had to remove all the locks from the doors. Um, it's... It's tough, but that's one of those things where um, uh, any any other suggestions, Bob? No, I mean, that, that makes sense, actually, um, you know, removing the locks. Um, 
I mean, why is he? Uh, why is he actually doing it? So he's going out of the room and he's locking her. In. Yeah. He's locking her out of the room. Or potentially, I know I've heard a lot right. of the other thing where they lock. Someone may lock themselves in the room. Okay. Um, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, removing the locks would be one thing, but uh, I'd be curious to know why he's doing it as well. <laughs> yeah, getting well, to the root, if you can. What's the trigger there? Well, why is he causing that? You know, does he not want to be with his wife? Sorry. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, Susan says, can you help if they're in late stage and nonverbal? And Susan, I, again, I, I want to hear what Bob has to say, but one of the one of the most amazing things, you know, if you watch the Alive Inside movie, yeah um the glenn campbell movie music can sometimes be a, a trigger that unlocks mm -hmm. the that and in those both of those movies you see people that are totally incoherent or nonverbal mm -hmm. when music that they love or used to love is on it's it's like a switch is is turned on it is i've heard it described as a back door to the brain music and you can get situations where people are nonverbal in the sense that they, they can't hold a conversation anymore. And you can play a piece of music that is familiar to them and they can sing every line of the song and sometimes actually continue talking afterwards. Oh. Generally speaking, somebody in the later stages is actually going to be perhaps easier to manage if they're sort of not walking around so much. Um, than somebody saying like in the middle stages with with sort of the confusion. Okay, but, uh, but yeah, music is fine. I, I can't believe uh, we're definitely going over. I didn't expect <laughs> anything else. But uh, so folks, if you have to jump off, this is recorded. We got a few more questions, and then we'll wrap things up. And I and I say we should. I, I actually feel like this uh, discussion of behavior, it, like. It's more like a, it's almost like a support group, but brainstorming around these actual incidents that people are going through on a daily basis is very therapeutic and, and a lot of good ideas may come out of it. Um, let's see, Robert says, a friend told me how he got kicked out of an assisted living community. He ran down the hall naked at midnight yelling fire. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, it's not too difficult to get kicked out of a community. I want to um applaud those communities that recognize this behavior and as opposed to we're sending you to the er or we're just kicking you out really try to uh come up with a solution and understanding that mm. this person under any other condition would not be doing these things um, no, no and in fact I'll, I'll just follow on from what you actually said there with that example um I mean, A, yes, moving a person from one facility to another, it's just moving the problem. It's not addressing the issue. So I don't think that's good. But there was a guy in a facility and uh, he kept pulling the fire alarm. And so I said, you know, we can't have this going on. What, you know, why is he doing this? And, and they sort of threatened him in the end. And his family said, look, if he stops pulling the fire alarm, we're going to have to sort of, you know, ask him to leave. And then they, again, they sort of found out a little bit of social history here, did a bit of research, and they find out that, found out he was actually the local retired fire chief. <laughs> and when he, when he pulled the bell, the fire truck used to come to the facility, so you get to see his red fire truck. So what they did after that was they arranged for him to actually go down to the fire station once a week and just sit there with some of the firefighters. And he stopped pulling the bell or the fire alarm. It's, so. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's make this the last uh, the last question here. Uh, Janet says the family is trying to get a person with dementia to move from an independent living community to a memory care community. She refuses to go and is uncooperative during the pre acceptance interview. Any suggestions? I I, I know that this is a a uh, an interesting story that that has been told like the telephone thing of where. Um, I think there was, uh, the way I remember it is, somebody came to a community and instead of going to a community to move there, it was, mom, you're going for a job interview. And the admission staff interviewed her as though she was going for a job. And they said, well, Mrs. Smith, we will call you later if you're accepted for this position. And, um, you know, then it was actually an adult daycare where they did mm -hmm. that. And mm -hmm. so 
the person went every day to the adult daycare because they thought it was their job. Yeah. Um, but but it might be playing around with some things like that uh, uh, in Janet's situation. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think you covered it, Steve. You know, you've got to be sort of creative. But again, you know, they know who she is better than you and I do. You know, they know what they can say and get away with. Um, you know, and that is the important. Or it's, um, you know, oh, it's just a holiday. Um, or, um, you know, well, we get your house or your apartment repainted or something like that. It's just temporary. Um, you know. Man, this, this, was, this was amazing. I, I, I really thank you, Bob, for a great presentation. We, we need to build on this. And, um, uh, and thank you so much to our audience members because when these questions, it never, you never fail. It's once we get to the Q&A, it really moves this, these mm -hmm. discussions to a much more authentic uh, place. Yeah. And um, so Leslie, great job again in uh, getting us a great program. Yeah, thank you, Steve. And, and thank you, you know, Bob, for all of the information. One of the things I also did want to reiterate was, you know, the, the need for support groups and for everybody that's on here to ask for help and that it's okay to ask for help. Um, a lot of these creative interventions, you know, when you're tired and you're exhausted and you're emotional and you're in the middle of it, it's hard to come up with improv, you know? <clears throat> Absolutely. And by meeting regularly with folks that just get it, you don't even have to explain to them what you're going through. You can just talk. Um, it's, it's immensely supportive. It validates where you are and what you guys are trying to do to be there for your loved one. So you can get through the emotional reaction you're having and really be able to figure out what they're trying to communicate. Because the reason why we're here and we're doing all this is, is love. Um, so I highly suggest getting in those support groups and finding out what interventions and what things work and how other people get creative so that you have that toolkit. Um, and you know, when you're in the middle of it on the spot, you, you don't have to draw from your own recall. If I could just thank you so much for that plug for support groups, Leslie. Um, if I could just mention that the association has over 70 different support group sessions that meet on a monthly basis. Most are still virtual, some are in person. So please reach out to us and we can certainly help you identify a group that would meet with your schedule. Thank you, Karen. And Tall Oaks is actually working to bring back our monthly support group in person. Um, we, uh, we utilize the Alzheimer's Association for that to facilitate prior to the pandemic. During the pandemic, it kind of lost its steam yeah. um, with virtual and people struggling to kind of connect. Um, virtually. However, we've all kind of gotten used to that now and reading the nonverbals and being able to do that. So that is in the works for us to either do a hybrid fashion or, um, you know, in person here at Tall Oaks. So stay Excellent. Tuned. Great. Thank you. All right, folks. Well, thanks again. And we'll see you next week. We got a bunch of uh, great discussions, but I'm going to, this is recorded and, and I'm going to email, I'm going to get back in the habit of just emailing it to all the registrants. Uh, I'm actually going to send out Steve, oh, you're uh, gonna send the it. Link. Okay. I'll send the link to the video as well as um, the uh, slide notes from this event, the workbook, and then on um, that fact sheet that was at the end okay. with all of the uh, resources that the Alzheimer's Association has. So I, I love will it. get with I'll, Karen and get that out to everybody. I'll get, I'll get the link later this afternoon. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.